one of four uh, consultants here at this innovative One Welbeck uh, Sporting Hip and Groin Pain uh, webinar. Uh, so we're going to take turns in this. We've got a, a consultant obstetrician who may have to go and uh, deliver uh, a birth. So we might um, be stuck with three speakers today. Just to remind you, if you can, just to um, make sure that you mute yourselves for the uh, webinar. And if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to forward these uh, on the question and answer page. So at One Welbeck, uh, we pride ourselves on some innovation of trying to really work with insurance companies and referrers to try and triage patients correctly so that patients get to the right practitioner the first time. However, there's some conditions where there can be a lot of gray. And one of those conditions I think is uh, the sporting hip and groin because MSK really transcends into other areas such as uh, the pelvis, uh, gynecology, um, potentially uh, colorectal surgery, and of course, um, hernias. Uh, so I'm a sports and exercise medicine consultant. I, um, I work in uh, elite sport, I also work in private practice, uh, and I work in the military, and I see a lot of hip and groin pain in the sporting population. It's a very challenging area. Uh, and my journey really started back in 2000. So I was a young uh, bumpkin then, I was uh, in my mid twenties. I'm definitely showing my age now. Uh, it was a conference in 2000 on groin pain and really there was a who's who of, uh, of sports and exercise medicine, orthopedics at this conference. And they were talking about groin pain and I was thinking, okay, well, I've done six to 12 months of orthopedics. You know, what, what's the differential of groin pain? I thought, well, there's hip joint arthritis and also uh, hernia uh, and then you know perhaps some other um, you know possible conditions and their first slide was uh, a differential of, of uh, pubic uh, or certainly groin pain uh, in the sporting athlete and many of these conditions I mean osteitis pubis label tear I hadn't even heard of uh, I've heard of stress fractures but not in the femoral neck and tendinopathy I hadn't even heard of the word and, and 20 years later uh, that's one of my special interests uh, also, there's you know, hernia. I've, I've, heard, I've heard, obviously, of hernia, but not sportsman's hernia, and certainly not Gilmore's groin. And you've also got other, other potential causes of uh, groin pain. You've got referred from the lumbar spine, you've got nerve entrapments, you've got vascular causes, uh, and of course, you've got gynecological, urological causes and, and red flags, such as malignancy. So you can see MSK practice really transcends into these other areas, so it can be very challenging. And why is it challenging? Because the anatomy is very complicated. So not only do you have the osteology, you have the hip joint, you have the pubic symphysis, you've got the sacrum, the sacroiliac joint, you've got the lumbar spine, you've got these huge muscles. So this is the iliosolus muscle. This muscle starts at the uh, vertebrae and then it, it, it moves distally and attaches to the lesser trochanter. But in addition to that, you've also got the viscera. So you've got the bladder, you've got the uterus, you've got the fallopian tubes, you've also got the colon. Uh, you've got the sacroiliac joint behind it, you've got the lumbar spine. So in athletes, in, in many cases, certainly athletes that I tend to see, it can be obvious there's acute trauma. They have trauma to their tendon, their muscle, potentially some sort of organ. But in many athletes I tend to see, it's not trauma-related pain. It's actually chronic overload pain. Overload forces onto the different structures, particularly onto this area here, which is the pubic symphysis area. And I'm going to be talking about the most common condition that I tend to see, which is in this area here, which is in the pubic symphysis area. So you've got the joint, but you've also got attachments of tendons and ligaments, and these can be overloaded and cause pain. So previously, we've, we've termed pubic overload as uh, it, you know, it's quite confusing. You've got all these terms, osteitis puba, pubis, uh, athletic pubialgia, adductor tendinopathy, rectus abdominis tendinopathy, and iliosolus tendinopathy. There was a group of experts that came together in 2015 and really came to a, a consensus and agreement about these different uh, pathological uh, conditions in this area on the pubic synthesis. And in fact, they said that rather than saying it's something is osteitis pubis or orthotic pubalgia, it should be defined based on the area. So you've got adductor-related groin pain, you've got 
uh, inguinal-related groin pain, iliosalis-related groin pain, and then pubic-related groin pain. What I tend to do is I say it's pubic overload with an adductor bias, pubic overload with an inguinal bias, pubic overload with a pubic symphysis bias. And that also determines how we manage these patients, which are generally um, conservative in rehab. So what are the top three clinical findings of this condition? So the first uh, top clinical findings is you need to beware the female with pubic overload. It's very, very rare. It's certainly in all the athletes that I've seen, probably one in 20 to one in 30 a female with this condition. So I've certainly, if you've got a female that has been diagnosed with pubic overload or pubic symphysis pain or insertional ductal tendinopathy, think about differentials. Now, invariably, what happens with this pain uh, is that the pain changes. So athletes often present with adductor pain one day, then they come in and present with suprapubic pain, and sometimes it goes to the other side. It's usually worse after change of direction running. And they often have, and this is very interesting because, again, it transcends into other areas, they often, if it gets really bad, have pain with coughing and sneezing. And so, therefore, they're diagnosed often with a hernia. And, in fact, it's not a hernia. It's actually pubic overload. And in some cases, in fact, they can get significant night pain. And that depends upon the amount of load they put on this area. So what I tend to do when I examine patients with what I suspect is pubic overload, I'd examine their hip joint, I'd examine for a hernia, but I'd also look at particular stresses for that pubic symphysis area. So I like doing reproduction uh, loading exercises. So this is an example of a hip, hip adductor uh, resisted exercise. This here is a typical squeeze test, and this is a Thomas test. So invariably what you're tending to do is you're tending to stress that pubic symphysis and its attachments. And the important thing here is trying to get the patient to reproduce their symptoms. So do they get pain and is their pain the same pain they feel, they feel when they run, when they play sport? That's really, really important. Also, people talk about palpation. Now, I find this less useful, particularly for pubic overload or pubic symphysis pain. There was a paper here in, uh, from 2019 by Flavi that suggests that you should point to the pubic tubicle and then palpate around that pubic tubicle and it's a clock face so you, so you move from the superficial inguinal ring to the inguinal ligament to the adductor longus tendon to the pubic symphysis. Again I don't find palpation tenderness that uh, useful generally. And the third clinical feature is imaging. Now this is where it becomes really interesting because the imaging findings we see particularly in very active people we often see bone edema in the pubic symphysis area. You see degeneration in the cartilage. You see adductor tendinosis. You may see rectus abdominis tendinosis, partial tears. In fact, if you look at the studies, we also see this in a lot of asymptomatic patients. So we need to question the relevance uh, of, of these changes that we see and certainly fit the changes to our clinical presentation. And so I think with imaging and pubic overload, the most important aspect is trying to exclude those other causes. So exclude hip joint, exclude hernia, uh, and exclude potentially gynecological issues uh, or referred pain for lumbar spine. And this is an example here of an athlete. Well, I wouldn't say it's an athlete. This is my hip. But an athlete who, uh, or an active person who actually presented with adductor pain, but in fact had a femoral neck stress fracture and I presented primarily with adductor pain and I thought I had pubic overload until I got examined by a fellow colleague of mine who said, I think you've got a, a, a stress fracture and lo and behold, it was a stress fracture. So in these cases, I find imaging quite useful um, to exclude other causes. And that's a fantastic segue to um, Prim, who will talk now about how we can define hip joint as a potential cause of groin pain. So Mr. Achan is a consultant orthopedic surgeon. He works at One Wellback and he has an interest in hip and knee surgery. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome. Thank you, Lorenzo. That's awesome. So um, I was super excited uh, when I was asked to uh, 
join this group because you know I've slightly got webinar fatigue in terms of what we've been hearing over the COVID lockdown and as we go into a second COVID lockdown just hearing more and more people saying this is what I do sounded like a, a, a really frustrating option to me so when Lorenzo and Rupal put this together and not only mentioned what the topic was because it it is a tricky topic to deal with but then said we were going to go multidisciplinary it was super exciting and uh, it is a problem that I think is challenging for everyone uh, involved with the hip joint so just as Lorenzo said, I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon. I work at Bart's Health in my NHS practice, but uh, I'm the chair of the orthopedic group at One Welbeck. Um, and I'm fellowship trained in hip and knee soft tissue reconstruction as well as arthroplasty. And so the hip and knee joints are kind of my area of interest. And Lorenzo was very specific in saying, you've only got 15 minutes, keep it simple. And we want people to ask questions at the end. So I've come into this with a very simple approach of how my simple mind works when somebody comes to me with hip pain. Uh, it could, you know, it could even be a corridor conversation or somebody on the telephone who says, I've got a patient with hip pain. I'd be really grateful if you could see them. And the first things that go, go through my mind, I categorize in these four areas. One is the age of the patient. Two is the general site of where their hip pain is because the term hip pain, uh, when you ask a patient to point to what they mean by that, it will never cease to amaze me about what a patient could perceive as being hip pain. Um, I'll talk about categories because really when it comes to orthopedic, we work about the hip joint and, and talk about intracapsular, extracapsular and what fits into that. And then the history of the presenting complaint. So that's all pretty simple. Um, it used to be that there were three simple categories you could talk about with regards to hip pain. There was the under 15 year old child. And this was the dangerous thing when you're training as an orthopedic surgeon, don't miss infection, don't miss hip, hip pathology that could have long-term consequences. The 15 to 45 year olds were the sports injuries. And that's predominantly what this talk is about. And then the 45 to 100 or however long people are living now, that was a group of degenerative pathology. Now, the honest truth is, and everybody here will agree with me uh, in terms of people on the panel, these boundaries don't really mean anything. We are seeing, you know, as, as the 14-year-old schoolboy rugby player is drinking his protein shakes and invariably bigger than me in stature, and that's not just down in, in New Zealand, that's, we're seeing that here. You can see sports injuries in anyone. Um, it's the same of that 45 to 100 uh, age group. I've got a personal disclosure. I'm over 50 now. I'm still active in terms of playing sport. And I would anticipate that rather than degenerative conditions, I would want my clinician to be considering uh, a sports type injury. However, I will mention, and, and Lorenzo touched on this, never forget the super rare thing. When a patient comes to you, uh, tumors, particularly around this area, chondrosarcomas, soft tissue sarcomas, all still exist. There is a bimodal distribution, so you do see them in the very young and then the older person. Um, but the trigger for me is night pain, not pain that wakes them up at night when they're moving, but a throbbing, aching pain that's there at night. And that's kind of pathognomonic for what we're worried about. I talked about categories. We really do try and divide them up into what is intra-articular. So something happening within the capsule of the joint. Um, and that is amenable to my surgical intervention. Okay, if it is extra capsular, and this often includes these muscles that are adherent to the capsule, then we are thinking around tendinopathy, muscle tear, bursitis. I personally feel these are much better managed because it's a long term management by a combination of a sports and exercise physician and a physiotherapist. And the really thrilling thing for me uh, when we set up the One Welbeck group. Uh, is how we've integrated a really ace team of sports and exercise physicians where I don't have to say to the patient, look, you don't need surgery, but you need to go and find someone. Uh, I, I can just pass them on to people I trust uh, in terms of, of dealing with them. The history, there are two, two simple categories for me, the acute injury. Um, and it's easy if it's a fracture. Often they go to A&E, the A&E pick it up. Uh, ironically, it's when there isn't a fracture and the pathology is soft tissue that there's more of a concern. And we see this a lot in the ski season when people are going uh, off-piste and, and, and having an innocuous fall that they don't recall. 
and then coming on to develop further pathology in the form of a labral tear. And one of the things that's often asked to me is, I've had this cam appearance surely since I stopped uh, growing age 13. Why did I get my tear age 37? Right, And it is something to do like a meniscal tear with the constituency and the water content of these labrum. And also uh, going into these extreme positions without necessarily gently stretching them. There are also the chronic longer term uh, conditions around the hip. Obviously, the degenerative osteoarthritis is very much my, uh, my port of call for arthroplasty, whereas the soft tissue stuff is more amenable to arthroscopic surgery. Um, but again, I would stress working in a multidisciplinary team with these, with these kind of patients is hugely helpful. When it comes to how I assess them, it's very simple. The examination for me, ex rolling a patient's leg when they're lying on your examination couch in extension will tell me whether they have an irritable hip. For me, it's a very, very sensitive and easy investigation to do without getting specific as to where the problem lies. That usually represents an intra-articular problem. When I rotate them in flexion, there is a crossover between me testing the labrum, but also a lot of the muscular conditions uh, that Lorenzo was alluding to. And the last thing, which is the Stinchfield test, uh, it, it's often referred to, which is a resisted straight leg raise, will also tell me clinically whether this problem is coming from within the hip joint and the soft tissues around it, or whether I should be looking to someone else. Imaging, I think a plain x-ray is hugely helpful to exclude a fracture or a tumor. And I'm slightly reticent, possibly because of my upbringing in, in, in orthopedics and doing some tumor work. I always would implore people to get a plain x-ray because what it excludes is just important, as important in your management of the patient as what it doesn't. An MRI scan, often people ask me, is there a place for an MR arthrogram now that we have three Tesla MR? I think for me at least, if I'm thinking about intra-articular pathology, then when they put a needle into the hip joint to introduce the contrast, they also put some local anesthetic in and I get a local anesthetic study as well, which you don't get if you, if you opt for a three Tesla MR. So in terms of the site, I have some just very simple things that are triggers for me. If the pain is coming round the back, so they put their hand round their back, I'm immediately thinking, could this be a uh, lumbar spine? Could this be SI joint? If they talk about the groin being anything above uh, that red line, which runs from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle, then I'm thinking general surgeon, right? Uh, often things like cough impulse, abdominal tears, hernias, all of that. Uh, for me, anything on that line or above isn't my remit. The C sign, which is when they form a C with their fingers, that's pathognomonic uh, in textbooks, at least, for uh, femoral stabular impingement. And then the last thing is that yellow square, which, uh, which is the obturator distribution on the inner thigh. If a female patient tells me that's where they feel their, sim feel their symptoms, I'm immediately thinking, um, consider referral uh, for intrapelvic pathology to one of my gynae colleagues. That's kind of ballpark uh, where I stand. So I would say because of the way the system works, whether my referral comes in from a GP, from a sports and exercise physician, from an experienced physiotherapist, uh, all of these, the majority of them have been triaged by very skilled people. So I, I would say in inevitably those patients are well managed by me, but there is about 20% of these patients who are a challenge. Um, there isn't a simple answer to them. And for me, really, one of the reasons this was so exciting is one Welbeck is the solution. Because, uh, you know, I think you could refer these patients that are challenging to anyone on this panel. And we've also got a rheumatology team that is brilliant. And they are likely to provide you with a solution. I, up to now, have found it incredibly frustrating when I get patients referred from Geneva or Paris who come all the way to see me uh, on recommendation, I do an assessment and I say to you, you know what, your problem is not within the hip joint, but I need you to go and see somebody else. And now I don't need to do that anymore, which is why um, it's, it's so much fun to be part of this team.
So thank you all very much. Thank you, Lorenzo. Did I keep to time? Thanks, I no effect. That's, that's great. That's great. Perfect. Okay. Uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Jonathan Wilson. He is a consultant colorectal surgeon, general surgeon with an interest in hernia. And he's got some very interesting area, uh, interesting uh, uh, topics to discuss with regard to diagnosis and management of hernias in uh, sporting population. Thanks. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yep. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd just like to second uh, Prim and, and Lorenzo's comments about an exciting group of people at the One Well Back. Uh, it, it's often an area that doesn't get the multidisciplinary team approach that it deserves. So, um, I'm a general surgeon, uh, and as part of that, I deal with hernias, groin hernias, abdominal wall hernias, laparoscopic and open. And um, can We're you going to touch briefly on why do we fix them? Um, are there sorry, Jonathan, can you can you just share your screen because I, I don't think it's uh, you've got it shared. Uh, okay, just a second. Just go down to share screen. Perfect. Yep. And then your your um. Perfect. Okay, so uh, why do we fix them? Uh, why would we not fix them and what are the risks of actually fixing them? So some basic anatomy for you. Um, the, the picture on the left is deliberately complicated and busy because uh, as we've alluded to, there's a lot of different things that, uh, within the differential. Um, you can see this is the area of interest for me. Uh, when patients are referred, they, they as a query hernia, we need to do a very careful clinical examination of the area uh, to see if there is one or not. You can see on the right hand side that this is your classic open repair or a Liechtenstein mesh repair where the spermatic cord has been defined, ilioinguinal nerve running along the top, and a polypropylene mesh is laid on from the anterior approach. Um, this is more of a laparoscopic view that we get. Uh, sorry just go back there where the peritoneum has been stripped back and you can see the inferior epigastric vessel which is the the key landmark for the for the hernia surgeon separating the direct hernias from the indirect hernia and you can see the deep inguinal ring there's a lot of major clockwork um, when we do these laparoscopically you can see we're, we're operating in the vicinity of the external iliac vein an artery, so this is referred to as the triangle of doom. And then further laterally, we've got the triangle of pain because we've got a leash of important nerves that we're operating beside and traumatizing with the surgical dissection. And then we're gonna put a jolly great 15 by 12 centimeter mesh over the top of that, which can be irritant as well. So these are significant enough operations uh, another view there, laparoscopically, you can see the, the peritoneal sac just going into the deep ring. Um, you can see the inferior epigastric artery running up there. There's just the beautiful anatomical diagram with the peritoneum stripped off. And again, we've got the femoral hernia region, obturator hernia region, indirect hernia region and direct. So we've, we've basically got three or four hernial orifices there that we need to assess carefully during surgery. And at the end of the laparoscopic, this is a TEP repair, a total extra peritoneal repair. We've got a 15 by 12 centimeter mesh. There are at least half a dozen commonly used meshes. The list expands on a monthly basis. Uh, there's a constant stream of reps at the door uh, during the theater lists wanting to talk about the new mesh so it's a burgeoning field but suffice it to say that there's significant meshes and, and the reason i labor that point it, it will be revealed in the last couple of slides so what are the really important things for me as usual and we can we can never get away from the fact that the history and the examination are paramount uh, the history of a lump or an asymmetry that the patients noticed in the shower or whether they, when they're standing up uh, or if they are a, of a higher body mass index the sensation of gurgling if you've got some intestinal component in the hernial sac or the sensation of it popping back in when they massage the lump 
or when they lie flat. Uh, these are real hallmarks of a hernia, even if you can't really feel one. Examination, both standing and lying with uh, valsalva maneuver, getting the patient to really cough and both legs up off the end of the bed when they're supine. So th these are crucial parts of the examination. Then we're on to imaging. Now, not all of these patients will, will have a scan. I mean, if there's an obvious hernia and it, and it fits with the, the history, then we're not going to image these patients. But maybe, I think, Prim, you mentioned the figure 20%. I, I would agree with that. That's a rough figure for where we don't see a hernia. Uh, and that's why the patient has been referred. Your history is going to focus in on the, the list of differentials. Could it be something obscure, prostate, gynecological? Is it going to be MSK? Am I going to need to send the patient to Lorenzo or Prem for a consideration of, of femoral joint or pubic overload? So your history is guided uh, to some extent, well, by what the patient is telling you uh, and what your clinical findings are. What about imaging? Well, one of my pet topics uh, the longer I practice as a consultant, the more, the more I see of the radiological hernia. So they, these are patients where you cannot feel a clinical hernia, uh, but they have had an ultrasound elsewhere, often by a non-hernia radiologist, and they're describing a little bit of fat prolapsing in and out of the deep ring. So this is called a hernia. And the patient comes with a preconceived idea, I've definitely got a hernia and I definitely need an operation. And that, that's, that's the pitfall patient because if it's not this tiny little bit of fat that's popping in and out that's causing the problems, and we do an operation involving a mesh, we know that up to 10% of these patients can get chronic pain because of the dissection and the mesh. And we've not done the patient any favors if that has not been the actual cause of pain. So. The first thing we do is we consider whether or not we repeat the imaging with an expert radiologist in the field, a dynamic ultrasound initially uh, with a detailed history from the radiologist and adequate bowel salva, both in the standing and the lying positions. What I'm really interested from the radiologist is, is there pinpoint tenderness with the probe uh, away from the hernia? So is it mainly over the pubic tubercle? or is it sort of drifting below the inguinal ligament? Is it into the orthopedic domain? Um, or is it right smack bang on the, the deep ring where the radiologist can see the extra peritoneal fat coming in and out? So that would make, lead me to think that it is perhaps the small hernia. Um, if we're still perplexed by the diagnosis, we will reach for the dynamic MRI. Uh, the information that you get from this is not just duplication of the ultrasound, it is complementary to the ultrasound. Um, at one while back, we, we have introduced an, an innovation with what we're calling the, the hybrid groin sequence, which is where we've got a static phase of the MRI looking at the anatomy, both of the inguinal canal, but also of the, the, the other regions that we've already mentioned, the, the hip joint and so on. We're going to have a static strain for 30 seconds Valsalva, trying to reproduce uh, occult hernias, and then a dynamic strain and relax sequence. And, and most importantly, these uh, scans are, are double reported by a, a radiologist with an interest in hernias, a sort of gastrointestinal radiologist usually, and also an MSK radiologist. Uh, so we get both of the radiologists reporting. We get a fantastic report often with videos attached uh, demonstrating the, the relevant problems, which, which I find absolutely superlative. So what are the risks of operating? Well, I've already talked about the radiological hernia or the clinically occult hernia, where obviously we, we love to operate. We, we'd fix all of these, but we need to know when not to operate. We also know that statistically in the UK, only a quarter of hernias are fixed laparoscopically. So, you know, the majority of these are being done open. We know the advantages of laparoscopic surgery. They're well defined. Uh, up to in the, Historically in the literature, up to 40% of patients can get the complication of chronic pain in the groin. Now, this is multifactorial, but it's a little bit about some patient factors, 
the pain of the, the trauma of the surgical dissection, the mesh, the fixation techniques for the mesh. And the incidence of pain varies between 7% laparoscopically and higher for the open group, up to 12%. And then you've got your other uh, complications such as infection in the wound, testicular atrophy, which can be chronically painful, recurrence of the hernia. So we need, we, we need to think carefully before we decide to operate. Um, we've talked about this already, uh, the causes for chronic pain. There's lots of nerves down there. We saw in the, the anatomical picture a moment ago, there are at least four nerves that were operating immediately on top of and laying a mesh on top of it. So it's not surprising that in a, a small group of patients can get chronic pain. And this really, and Tom, you, you may want to comment on this in a bit, the, the transvaginal mesh really brought meshes into, into the, the limelight for the media in the last couple of years. Uh, the use of, of these meshes for ladies with stress urinary incontinence. It, in some instances, it didn't go so well. There's, there's been some liturgy going on and, and it's put the, the spotlight on meshes. I think we've had some, they've extrapolated uh, th these outcomes into, well, where else are we using these meshes? We're using them in the groin for hernia. And quite rightly, people have asked the question, that, is it the right thing to be doing? We've been using meshes in the groin for at least 30 years or longer uh, with success and more attention drawn towards the groin mesh. Um, it just, I think it was December, just in the run up to lockdown, Victoria Derbyshire show um, interviewing patients who've had terrible outcomes from groin mesh. So yes, we need to think about it carefully. However, the Royal College of England are quite clear that um, certainly in Western medicine, uh, the, the standard of care still currently is a mesh repair for the hernias. There's a lot of good evidence to, to say that we do not see more pain in the mesh group compared with those with no meshes. There are one or two units in the world specializing in the no mesh technique. Their incidence of groin pain is not zero. So it's, it's complicated, it's multifactorial, but we're still advised that mesh is the standard of care from the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, so in conclusion, I'd say the history and the examination remain paramount. We need to think very carefully with patients who do not have an overt hernia uh, and who are easy to examine and we still can't find a hernia but we've got a radiological finding of a tiny hernia. Uh, do these people really need a, a mesh repair? We, we have got the beauty of falling back on our multidisciplinary team approach, world-class radiologists with innovation and with the dynamic MRI and so on. So no longer do we need to take a punt and just fix that hernia. We can rely on our sports and exercise physicians. We, we can find discussion around our MDT platform and we can ultimately get a much broader consensus of what the right thing to do is. So that's enough talk from me. Thanks, Thank John. You very much. Uh, very, very useful. I've got some questions for you at the end, uh, but we might just go to Tom. Um, and uh, Mr. Setchell is a consultant gynecologist who's also working at One Welbeck. He has an interest in min minimally invasive surgery for gynecological conditions, including endometriosis. Uh, and he'll be speaking about uh, gynecological causes for um, hip and groin pain in the active patient. Many, many thanks, uh, Lorenzo, and thank you, Lorenzo, as well, and Rupal for uh, for organising this. I'm just getting my slides up. I hope you can see them. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yep. Great. And there's the slides. So. Um, so I'm Tom Setchell, I'm a, a, as, as Lorenzo just said, I'm a gynecologist and also an obstetrician, which is why I'm here in my blues today, in fact, because I um, just by pure coincidence have a, a patient in labour and there's a small chance I may be asked to be whisked away to go and uh, attend the delivery. So sincere apologies if that happens, but so far so good. Um, 
So I've just listed um, some of the gynecological causes for pelvic pain in this slide here, uh, which for women is a very common uh, issue. It Tom, Tom, your slides aren't up. Can oh, really? Okay. Share the screen, yeah. Thank you. I shall try and remedy that now. Uh, just give me one moment. Sorry, guys. Share screen. Okay, let me try that again. Is that... No. No, oh dear, okay. Let's try that one more time. Sorry, I'm having to open system preferences to try and work out why not. <laughs> Okay. Anything? Perfect. Yep. Very good. Yes. You're up. I'm sorry, everybody. Okay, here we go. So, um, so yeah, so gynecological causes for pelvic pain. I think the, the key thing here with uh, gyne pathology, there's a lot of different uh, bits that can go wrong in the gynae pelvis and many many different causes for pain um, um, I think you know the the most common things that I'll see um, in younger women who are active and sporty would be uh, development of fibroids or endometriosis and classically as I'll get on to in a minute endometriosis will cause cyclical pain it will be in relation to the menstrual cycle it won't just be a constant pain it won't be related to exertion necessarily uh, and of course, it may be related to other things like sexual activity uh, and occasionally with endometriosis, if it's deep pelvic endometriosis, it can actually be related to defecation as well. Uh, and we see people with dyskesia or bowel uh, pain during defecation uh, when there is significant deep pelvic endometriosis uh, involving the uterus and the, the rectum being plastered together by inflammatory disease. Um, we also see other types of ovarian cysts and uh, just this week Lorenzo and I have had a little discussion about a patient of his who's had an incidental finding on a, of an ovarian cyst uh, on a musculoskeletal MRI scan. Um, that's a very, very common occurrence in the gynecology clinic and often these are physiological cysts that don't actually require any further intervention. Um, just during ovulation it's possible to have a, a three or a four centimeter ovulatory cysts which will actually resolve in the subsequent cycle uh, and those can be managed just with expectant management and further ultrasound imaging later. Um, as John alluded there's issues about TVT and mesh erosion in gynecology and, as, and that's now really a, a, a procedure which is not being done at all due to a class action in the states which has led to um, a lot of displeasure amongst patients. Um, so that's an operation that has fallen right out of, uh, uh, out of uh, normal practice. Um, and also we have to consider gynecological cancers, which um, although uh, relatively rare for ovarian pathology in younger women, actually it's very common for cervical cancer. So it's worth asking patients about their screening um, and whether they've had um, cervical screening recently. Um, of course, uh, you know, a tumour that grows into the pelvic side will can easily call neuro, cause neuropathic pain uh, and uh, hip or inguinal pain. Um, so I think the key thing from the gynecological history is where does the pain radiate to? We often see a gyne pelvic pain that radiates down the anterior thigh or to the lower back. It's extremely rare to see a pain in the lateral hip that's related to gynae pathology. Um, as I mentioned before, cyclical pain is very common and we often see pain that's associated with other menstrual symptoms, mood changes, breast tenderness, um, bloating, or, um, or many of the other host of PMS symptoms. Um, obviously any associated discharge or bleeding. Um, 
Uh, and I think it's really useful to know about whether they've been taking hormonal contraceptives because we often use those to treat uh, pelvic pain caused by endometriosis or adenomyosis. Um, and therefore, I think you know, that's a really important uh, part of the history. Um, in my experience, gynae pelvic pains are very rarely exacerbated by muscular movements. Uh, I think the only caveat to that would be large ovarian cysts or possibly fibroids that are really large and indenting into the sidewall and causing pressure symptoms. Um, but in general, hip movements don't tend to exacerbate the pain. Um, so just a few red flags and in, in patients after the menopause, uh, who obviously could still be active people, um, post-menopausal bleeding or onset of a new pain would always be a concerning sign and something that needs to be investigated, um, obviously associated with weight loss. And in younger women, post coital bleeding, which should be a two-week weight referral uh, for, uh, for, for colposcopy to assess for any possibility of cervical cancer. Um, in ovarian cancers, we see increasing abdominal girth, nausea, loss of appetite, uh, and any irregular vaginal bleeding in the over 40s could be an endometrial malignancy. So that would also need to be investigated urgently. Um, so clearly on examination, we're looking for abdominal masses, um, looking for lower abdominal and pelvic tenderness. And the bimanual examination is very important here. It can elicit tenderness um, if there's any cervical excitation. And um, the specular examination is also a very important opportunity not just to assess the cervix, but to look for uh, infection with um, chlamydia and gonorrhea screening um, and a smear test in case those are not up to date and to assess for prolapse. Obviously, if there were, was a history of a TVT or a mesh operation, it would also be an opportunity to assess for mesh erosion. Um, and gynae investigations tend to be fairly simple. Um, and a pelvic ultrasound scan will identify a large majority of gynae pathology. Um, obviously, we've always got to consider uh, pregnancy with a simple urinary pregnancy test um, and, and urinary symptoms uh, that could have been overlooked can be, uh, you know, with, with, with an MSU. Um, we use a CA125 in part for ovarian cancer tumor marker um, as, a, as, a, as a tumor marker, but also for adenomyosis and endometriosis where it's known to be elevated. So an elevated CA125 can be quite useful uh, in uh, pointing towards that kind of pathology in premenopausal women. If there's any doubt about uh, pathology, an MRI can be very useful. It will also tell us if there's deep pelvic endometriosis um, between the rectum and the uterus, uh, which is a really nasty condition um, with quite a, a difficult surgical option for treatment. Um, it is important when requesting an MRI of the pelvis that it's done with a gynae protocol if you're suspecting a gynae endometriotic pathology um, simply because uh, you know, the, the radiologist will, will be dedicated at looking at that place, that site, um, and have optimized the protocol for that. Um, we get dramatically different uh, uh, radiological opinions from different radiologists, and it's so important, just as my colleagues were intimating, to use a, a dedicated gynae radiologist if you're looking for deep pelvic endometriosis. Um, I think a therapeutic trial of a hormonal contraceptive is very, very useful. The Mirena or the combined pill can be really useful for uh, trying to uh, elucidate gynae causes. A three month therapeutic trial of the combined pill, if it improves the pain, then it's highly likely to be caused by endometriosis or adenomyosis. And we can use GnRH analogs, which obviously have uh, much wider side effects with menopausal side effects, which are really unwanted. But in severe cases of pelvic pain, if the pain disappears with the GnRH analogue, um, then it's highly likely to be caused by endometriosis. Um, we use laparoscopy both as a, a diagnostic tool and also for treatment. Um, just a couple of quick pictures. This is a torsion of the left tube and ovary that required cystectomy and untorsion. Um, we obviously try to avoid ovarian surgery wherever we can in, in younger women but it's sometimes uh, 
uh, unavoidable. And uh, this is an example of a, uh, a myonectomy with a large fibroid that was removed laparoscopically um, and still not really done enough laparoscopically in this country, but we're definitely improving as gynecologists and managing more of our operations uh, with minimally invasive techniques. So I think that's all that I had to say. So I'm going to move back to Lorenzo and we can open the floor for questions, I think. Thanks, Tom. Uh, if anyone, anyone's got any questions uh, uh, to any of the panellists, uh, feel free to type them in the question and answer. I'm going to ask uh, everyone, uh, so a couple of questions that I have, because this is just a private tutorial for me, really. Thank you. Uh, so Prim, uh, uh, about hip joints, uh, diagnostic injections, yay or nay? Um, I think based on a clinical examination, I find them very helpful in a specific subset of patients who already clearly on the examination also have lumbar spine or sacroiliac pathology. In sure. isolation, they're of little help. The other thing it helps me very much with is informing the patient about what kind of result they will get, particularly in arthroscopic intervention. Sure. If the local anesthetic takes away all their pain, then I give them a really positive spin on how they're going to do after the arthroscopic surgery. If it doesn't, then we both know that it doesn't completely exclude pathology inside the hip joint, but I'm slightly more cautious and I also make the recovery schedule a bit longer, working on the physiotherapy and all of that sort of stuff alongside it because I don't think their pain is uh, solely coming from within the, the joint. And obviously it's, it's more chronic in nature is my, is my take. And then the other question is with cortisone or without cortisone? So there was a time where everybody got uh, steroids simply because of its yeah. anti-inflammatory yeah. Uh, response. I think once the evidence came out that steroid was damaging to articular cartilage and sure. chondrocytes, then I've been much more con uh, cautious about its use. I will use it in patients who have established osteoarthritis, are trying to hold off surgery, and we're just trying to get symptom control. Sure. In the patient who is younger and more demanding, then visco supplementation is something that I, I think has a role. And certainly if they do benefit from one injection and return to function, then I will offer them further injection. Uh, but steroid in the younger person with good joint cartilage, I try and avoid. So would there be a role for doing, say, one cortisone and then maybe visco supplementation down the track? Or you would just prefer to go to visco supplementation? I would. Um, but you and I both know that we have patients who come with something that they've been training for. It's a single event. It could even be somebody who it's not activity related. They want to fly somewhere for their daughter's wedding and they want to dance that evening. I think yep. I would have a conversation with them. I don't think the damage to a joint is that great from a single injection. Sure. Once I've discussed that with my patient and the principle is clear, then we're doing it for a certain event. Then I don't really have an issue. But, you know, we've all seen the stories of Maradona, Chris Lewis, uh, you know, all these kind of elite athletes sure. who were injected with steroid to get them back in and they just constantly did further damage to their cartilage. So, sure. so it, it's, it's not a repeat thing for me. Okay, and um, image guided or without image guided? Always image guided for me. And for you, fluoroscopic or ultrasound? Ultrasound. So again, it's not something that I am doing simply because at One Wellbeck we've got two brilliant MSK radiologists. Uh, one of them has injected my shoulder three times with ultrasound guidance and it, I was slightly apprehensive about it. I can't say it was comfortable, but you know, all my patients just go on like I do about how uh, atraumatic it was and an experience that I could certainly tolerate again. Fine. Uh, you know, that ultrasound just tells them exactly where the needle needs to go. I know it's going to the right place. Great. Fine. Okay. Jonathan, uh, so um, my concern with hip and groin pain in, in ath athletes or in, in anyone really is missing the hernia. So, you know, we talked about overdiagnosis. My concern is underdiagnosis and missing the hernia. What do you think is the most is is the top clinical sort of sign for for a hernia? Is there is there one that you think this is definitely a hernia? For example, feeling a bulge or or is there something that you see mostly that? Yeah, 
And I mean, I think if you can see the bulge and and clinically confirm a hernia, then then it's in the bag, you know. And and it correlates with the history, and it's where the tenderness is. Yeah. Then that's that's a that's an easy diagnosis. Unfortunately, the the patient group that we're we're all having sleepless nights about are the ones where you can't examine the that there is no hernia to see clinically. Uh, they've got a normal inguinal canal on examination and uh and and it doesn't necessarily the history isn't consistent with a hernia either it could be nighttime pain you know not related to abdominal increased pressure and that's where that's where you really need the team approach you you need to know your radiologist intimately uh, that maybe sounds a bit weird but... you use your own uh radiologists uh, specialized in in yeah. uh, in hernia so, that's amazing so, that we have uh, have that team at one moment. So basically, I, I'm going to be very <laughs> I'm going to be very reluctant to to believe a, an external report unless there's very obvious clinical findings. If if the clinical findings are vaguer, you've got to go to where you know your radiologist. And as I say, that the ultrasound and the MRI are complementary in this instance, and what you need to know that your radiologist is is him him or herself taking a detailed history sure. to guide the ultrasound probe uh, and using sort of really state-of-the-art sequencing protocols with with the valsalva and dynamic components as well so for those that's fascinating for that, uh, the, the the new dynamic maneuvers that you've introduced do you think there's um there's good sensitivity in picking up because you obviously see these post surgery, don't you? You see them during surgery. Do you think there's a good uh, sensitivity there and specificity for hernia? Obviously, it would be specific, but sensitive. Does it pick up? Does the yeah. does dynamic MSK or sorry, dynamic MRI pick up the hernia? Yes, it does. I, I mean, I think it's more the, the it's always going to pick up the hernia. Um, I think it's it's almost the other way. It's that we're picking up too many hernias Fine. and whether it's actually the hernia that's genuinely causing the symptom or not in, in the clinically occult hernia is the really important thing to elicit. And Fine. that's where rather than wading in with the operation, I'm going to ask the orthopedic team and the gynae team and so on and, and, the, and the MSK, the, the sports physicians to really exhaust that list of differentials and know for definite that this is the small occult hernia that, that's potentially causing the symptoms. And then, then it's a discussion with the patient. You know, we, we don't know definitively that your hernia is the cause of the problem, but we've exhausted the other differentials and we're happy, if that's what the patient is keen cool. to do, we're happy to do that operation with the proviso that there are rare but recognized risks, in, including the issue about chronic pain. Can I ask you about what hernias do you absolutely need to repair immediately? Are there, are there hernias that, that uh, you know, if you have it, you need to repair it straight away? I, I believe femoral hernias are, uh, can strangulate. So, yeah, there, there's a higher incidence of strangulation in femoral. Also in ladies, we, we pay way more attention in females than men because we know that the risk of strangulation is greater, particularly with femoral. And just regarding females, how many females do you get that have an actual true hernia uh, compared so, to, to males? What's the ratio that you it's see? It's certainly less, it, it, you know, it's a more common condition in men, but, um, you know, having said that, our clinics, I can't, I can't give you the exact ratio off the top of my head, but, you know, it, it, is, it is a common condition in ladies as well. Now, but, in the age group that we're talking about, in the elite sports person, obviously the proportion of, of genuine hernias is smaller anyway, uh, and and particularly so in ladies. So, uh, but when we do see them in females, there is a higher risk of complication if mm. in the watch and wait category. So we're more mm. likely to fix them. I had a question here: Does the plane into which a mesh is placed, extra peritoneal, affect the likelihood of post-operative pain? That's so. A, a so Certainly laparoscopic, um, and that, that includes the extra peritoneal and the transabdominal approach, the incidence of chronic pain is about half that of the open group. And that's been, that's been demonstrated in Cochrane Review articles and so on. 
Um, in terms of differentiating between the two different laparoscopic methods, the literature goes both ways. So I think all we can say there is that lap is better than open when it comes to chronic pain. And there will be proponents for either TEP, which is total extraperitoneal placement, or the transabdominal approach. And as to which technique we choose, surgeons tend to get trained, certainly in the UK, in one method, uh, be it TEP or TAP, and they tend to try stick to that method. Sure. Uh, but um, you know, I was I was disappointed to see the national statistic for the rate of lap surgery still in the UK is you know 25 percent being done laparoscopically wow, that's amazing so we got a, we got a long way to go to to oh. improve on that and i think okay. tom alluded to that so you, so you think you think laparoscopic is the way and do you think not not doing mesh is the way forward do you mention so, there's the uh, pain that's really controversial um certainly there's been a lot of uh, attention to meshes and there are units in the world that offer a, no, a non-mesh technique, such as the Shoulder Ice Clinic in Toronto. Now, the fact that these centres haven't popped up all over the world perhaps tells us something. You know, they, it, it's a technique done there where the surgeons are doing 15 a day, five days a week. So, of course, their results are going to be excellent. Sure, and I, sure. I dare say if you had a unit that was doing that with laparoscopic tap placement, their outcomes would be absolutely fantastic as well. A hernia uh, machine sure. center with mesh would probably produce very good data as well. So I, I, it's, you have to be careful when, you, when you're looking at subspecialist centers like that and is that applicable across the world. But it's a really hot topic. Um, there are, you know, someone mentioned the sportsman's hernia or Gilmore's groin. Yes. Or inguinal disruption. That's a hot topic. That, that's another hot topic. <laughs> that's um, a hot topic among yeah. sports, sports med physicians. And uh, yeah. I mean, my, my personal belief is that it's rare. Uh, I think it's either a true hernia or not a hernia. And if it's not a hernia, then I think you should treat it conservatively. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very wary about diagnosing sportsman's hernia in, in anyone, including an elite, elite athlete. And I'm not convinced um, with regard to this, um, you know, repair of, of the conjoint tendon or um, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced. I, I think it's either a hernia or not a hernia. And I, I think you need to be very careful. Yeah. Well, I think when you look at the operations that are offered for, for these, uh, for inguinal disruption, um, the detachment of the inguinal ligament from the tubercle and uh, with or without large pieces of mesh, it's a, it's a fairly significant undertaking. Sure. There aren't any randomized trials comparing the techniques. All we've got is consensus documents um, eight years ago, you know, we're discussing the pros and cons of, of the various techniques. And some of those techniques are just simple hernia repairs. You know, they're okay. not, they're not releasing tension in inguinal ligaments. So it's a real heterogeneous mix match of operations. And, I and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not disputing that perhaps people do well, but how can, we, how can we know that it's not the rest period and the intensive rehab and physio that actually gets them over the line at, at the end? You know, we, we just haven't if you, got this. If you're, you're going to rest an athlete for eight weeks and rehab them, you're probably going to get a lot of uh, what I would argue is pubic overload pain um, uh, better, uh, and I, I think I think there's a there's a lot of overlap uh, between what we call sportsman's hernia and and what I call pubic overload. You can diagnose it as inguinal related um, uh, uh, groin pain uh, in the consensus. Uh, it's, a, it's a very hot topic and, and very confusing and I try and avoid surgery if at all possible. The, the other thing that I find um, slightly confusing there is the, the, the list of five points where you need three out of five points to make a diagnosis of it. These points cover essentially all manner of symptoms in the groin ranging from adductor longus insertion tenderness to superficial ring tenderness, deep ring tenderness pain in the perineum you know it's so so you can if there's a will you can make the diagnosis 
you can't see it on an MRI or an ultrasound. So it's basically an expert with a specialist interest in the area, choosing from a, a wide range of symptoms and you can make the diagnosis. So I, I would agree with you, I'd be much more on the conservative side. Very cautious. Yeah, exhausting. Uh, Tom, Tom I'd, I'd like to get you in. Um, so my- Sadly, Lorenzo, Tom's actually been caught oh, in delivery left? now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, that, that's a shame because I was going to ask him about um, some gynecological issues, but that, that's fine. I, I want to uh, discuss, um, you know, we talked about MRI and certainly um, with, with hip and groin, um, we've got lots of different protocols. So we've got hip protocol, we've got the pubic symphysis protocol, we've got now dynamic protocol, we've got potentially gynecological protocol. Um, do you think it'd be possible to to put these together? And uh, I mean, I, I probably should ask a radio MSK radiologist or a specialised radiologist. But it's very confusing if you if if you're not exactly sure what the diagnosis is, um, and you're and you're looking at these other um, potential pathologies. Do you guys have any comments about that? Um, I think you're right. It's well, I know that having spoken to two of the radiologists that are that are doing the joint reporting on the the groin hybrid protocol that it, it is a fairly lengthy sequence that that is done so the more the more boxes you're trying to tick the longer the scan uh, we all know that patients find mri a little bit less desirable than ct yes. and so on yes. and there's the claustrophobia aspect as well so um yeah, I, I we'd have to ask that to one of the radiologists, but I think the more you try and do, the longer the scan and the more complex the reporting. I suppose it goes back to, to clinical clinical impression, doesn't it? If you if you feel it's a musculoskeletal problem, then you would focus on musculoskeletal protocol. If you feel it's more of a pelvic condition, then probably onward referral to say you or one of the gynaecologists for a, an assessment opinion, and then. And then off to see your specialised um, radiologist. Yeah, I think Lorenzo, my take on that is, um, as you as you both rightly point out, the clinical examination is quite key. And once you've made that suspicion around, is this anterior abdominal wall? Is it pubic overload? Then if you specifically request that, because you're asking a specific MSK radiologist to look at it. They, one, look for it, but are more reliant now and try and get the imaging on a three Tesla MR. And so, although they probably aren't, and that's what, again, is exciting about one Welbeck doing that in conjunction with a, a GI or a general surgical radiologist too, um, they are going to give you a much better inclination of yes. whether there is active pathology outside of the hip joint and more towards the pubic tubercle, abdominal wall, etc. You know, they, they will tell you about signal going up into the anterior wall or into the pubic symphysis. And I find I find that very helpful because my next port of call is to refer it to someone like Jonathan. Sure. Actually, we've got one of the message message from one of the radiologists, one Welbeck, saying that we do a hybrid groin protocol, as Jonathan was saying, which takes most of the elements of the standard hip and MSK pelvic protocol as well as hernia so it's it's quite a thorough assessment and i'm i'm a little bit more reassured um you know that maybe doing that protocol you're not going to miss you know potential diagnoses that could affect the way you manage this uh, in in quite quite concrete ways lorenzo can i can i also add that the the radiologists that we're using from the gi perspective are all part of the the colorectal cancer MDT scene. Yes. So we, we've all, each of us alluded to the fact that there can be red flag symptoms and rare but definite risks of, of tumors in the background. And I can think at the top of my head of at least three instances in the last six months where seemingly benign investigation with the right radiologist looking at the scan has drawn our attention to prostate or pelvic lymphadenopathy oh, okay. which has taken us down a, a very different route with it with a different outcome so it's quality radiology is at the center of this Absolutely. radiology is, is the key to getting yeah. this right there's a question about do i perform injections into the pubic symphysis uh, and uh, what with a secondary cleft sign is the local uh, injection. Okay, so 
Uh, the answer to that is I try not to because I think it's a very painful injection and I think it's not very useful generally. I have done it on occasion under ultrasound for someone that's desperate to play a final, but it really doesn't do very much. And I think it doesn't go to the heart of, of, uh, of why these athletes develop pubic overload, which is usually a biomechanical issue and an overload issue. Uh, and certainly um, I would try and stay away, if at all possible, from any injections into that pubic symphysis area, adductor tendon, if at all possible. I have done on occasion um, in desperate circumstances, but really trying to stay away. My, my, interestingly, my Spanish colleagues have, uh, have done, uh, have done some, some interesting case studies on nerve blocks around that area, injecting the anterior branch of the obturator nerve or the pudendal nerve for pain in the groin in, in athletes. And, and they think that's a better option to try and break the pain cycle for a couple of weeks uh, and then allow the athlete to continue with rehab. So they're doing some very interesting work using ultrasound to actually direct injections. So quite interesting there. And I'll, I'll be very interested to see if they're continuing with that work because it can help our elite athletes. Uh, and I certainly do a few nerve blocks on occasion for uh, hip and groin pain. Uh, I think we're probably at the end. Uh, if anyone else has got any questions or comments. Well, thank you everyone for uh, attending. I appreciate um, the attendance and the interesting questions that we had. Apologies for Tom, but he had to leave early. Uh, and uh, thank you. We're trying to develop a hip and groin, um, uh, a, a, a hip and groin uh, team or clinic so that patients that come in with these difficult hip and groins can be assessed and then managed appropriately.